All right, we're good to go? All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. It's good to be back in the saddle, the teaching saddle again. It's been a few months since I've been up uh, teaching. I think, wow, March, uh, end of February. I hadn't taught since then. And uh, actually, you know, uh, I was on a sabbatical, which m most of you knew about, and then I had it lined up during my sabbatical and then afterwards to teach. So this is my first time back in the teaching saddle, and I'm glad to be back with you guys. We want to welcome our online audience. Always uh, good to have you guys. And I tell you, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's a phenomenon, because I don't, I don't, <laughs> they tell you to uh, go back and watch yourself teach or preach, and that helps you be a better teacher or preacher. But I don't do it. Uh, so you just get mediocre, sorry. Because I just can't stand my own voice. I feel sorry for you guys. You get to hear me. You know how you hear yourself? And you're like, is that me? Turn it off, you know, turn it off. So I, it's really tough for me. So I don't, I don't watch, and not that anybody of our current live stream audience does this, but sometimes people, and you may not know this, but sometimes people are not nice on social media websites in their comments. I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not. So I made it a rule very early on, credit or criticism, I don't want to see it online. You know, so I don't, I don't read comments. I, don't, I just don't uh, look at that. So when I get to meet people, and I'm speaking directly to the online audience, when you come in uh, to town, we have a lot of people, maybe even some here today, uh, and say, oh, yeah, we watch your stuff. That's very encouraging. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, it's, you know, sometimes you wonder when you, when you do stuff, when we film things. Uh, I don't know if y'all were... If you're around my age or older, if you watch WKRP in Cincinnati, um, you know, and uh, Dr. Johnny Fever was on the on the midnight, uh, the late night show, and he said, you know, I just wonder, is anybody out there? <laughs> uh, and so you wonder, do people watch? They watch. So thank you, online audience, for watching and being a part, um, and for our people who uh, who come here live. It's uh, it's really encouraging. We. Uh, we're going to be studying this summer the book of 1 Timothy. And so if since we're going to be in 1 Timothy, go ahead and start turning to Acts 16. I know that doesn't seem to go together, but it'll make sense in a minute. Uh, and you know, begin to looking at why, why 1 Timothy. And we'll, of course, we'll take it into Titus and 2 Timothy in the fall. Uh, as I begin to look at the spreadsheet, we have a, a spreadsheet where we have records of, of what we've taught in all of our Sunday school Bible class times for the, since 2014, and we've never taught 1 Timothy. Never. We've referred to it a lot, but just digging into 1 Timothy, we've never done. And I thought, wow, what a great study to go into. I don't know why we haven't. It just other things uh, seem to take precedent, but here we are in 1 Timothy, and it is a great, rich text. There's some difficult things in it, uh, but we're, we'll get to that here in a minute. But uh, for the most part, it's a very easily digested book uh, or letter. Uh, so I, as we get started, you ever share with the audience a little bit uh, about your first time maybe you were ever asked to lead a prayer or serve communion? How did, how did that go for you there? Nervous? You, that was, was that you, Jason, said that? Nervous? What, what, uh, tell, tell me about it. How old were you? Oh, gosh. You were probably a teenager here, weren't you? Yes, when I was 13, and the first time was when the teens did communion. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I was up for the cup, is what I call it. Yeah, that's when we, when we had, you know, we'd yeah. separate it all out. And I looked out across here, I thought I was going to drop. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, <laughs> believe me, I, I do the same thing, yeah. What, uh, somebody else, first time you ever asked to pray or lead communion or, or anything? What about serving? How many of you served communion before? And what, what was, what, what are you nervous about? Tripping. Tripping and what? <laughs> Next thing you know, plates go everywhere. <laughs> And it's juice, it's crackers everywhere. That has happened. It sounds like somebody dropped a whole thing of hubcaps, you know? I mean, just going. 
if you're in your 30s, you don't know what hubcaps are, but if you're our, you know, hubcaps <laughs> predated rims, okay? So, um, but they, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you just worry about dropping all this, and then all of a sudden, or, or maybe you miss a, a row. Um, uh, some of you ladies are like, we've never done that. So uh, <laughs> but, I mean, we don't know that fear. But if you've, if you've ever prayed or if you've ever, what about the first time you ever had to share a testimony uh, on a Sunday morning or a Friday night? How many of you shared your testimony on Friday night? Yeah. Jessica, I, uh, I think I was there for it. I was there for it, or I was supposed to be, and I was out there. I can't remember, but how did you feel before? I felt really nervous and like my legs didn't settle. <laughs> Thank goodness for, these podiums aren't for notes. They're for leaning. <laughs> so you don't fall, you know, and, and dual purpose. That's why if you get four legs, a music stand doesn't work for you. You just sink down. What, um, yeah, you get nervous, but then you get into it, and you kind of you get your legs underneath you there. Um, yeah, you get up there, and, and if you're like me, uh, getting started, you're, you, you're really focused on this, and as long as I don't have to make eye contact. You know, it's, it's the, those first times of being asked to do something, uh, of being, okay, you're going to preside over this. You're going to be in charge of this. Hey, I need you to do this. Oh, oh. But you've watched, you've learned, and isn't it good that even whenever, and this is, I think, a, the gift of encouragement, when even when uh, we don't see things in ourselves, other people see them in us. And I admire those people that can, that can pull out of people the good and the, the talent that's there uh, and, and give challenge uh, people the opportunity. That, in essence, is 1 Timothy. That is kind of the nature of what's going on in 1 Timothy. Here is, uh, and we're going to look at a, a lot of that today. You have Timothy who's left in Ephesus to, and he's got certain tasks he's got to do. And he's flying solo without Paul. And as we'll see, he's a very timid person. And he's got to, he's got to do it. And he's young. Oh, I can't do this. You know, what, what are some of the things that we say whenever we're asked to do something? What, what are some of our Moses excuses that we can't, that, that, we, that we give? Say it. Boy, y'all, 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 y'all were very quick from both sides of the room with excuses that you give. <laughs> They're automatic. <laughs> well, I can't handle this. I don't speak well. Who am I? Or me? Who me? <laughs> what else? What are some of the other excuses that we use? Too young. I'm too young. You're not Johnny anymore, but at one time you were. <laughs> at one time you were. And, and really, as I'm in my mid-50s now, age is very relevant. I mean, you're still very young to me, Johnny. You really are. So, uh, but yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah, at, yeah I'm too young. Uh, I don't... I don't have enough experience. I don't know enough. Give me some time. Yeah, and, and so that's, that's kind of those, probably those things that came up in Timothy's mind. Oh, Paul, I can't do this. I'm too young. Who, me? <laughs> you want me? I don't speak well. Uh, you know my stomach issues. It's just those, those things. And, and that's actually a legitimate thing. He tells them, take a little wine for your stomach there. And little wine for your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> for too long well never mind I'll go off I better stick to the notes the, uh, so we're going to spend some time delving into this very personal letter that Paul wrote to Timothy it's going to be somewhat of an exegetical study and uh, loosely exegetical we're not going to break down a whole lot of uh, parsing of Greek words and verbs but we will get into the text in its context and understanding the situation before we start making application. Um, if you've heard, uh, been in some of the classes before about how to do that, um, this one we did in the, in the spring of, of the, you know, the journey, uh, the interpretive journey, 
we want to understand then and there before we start making application to here and now. Because too many times we'll, uh, as they taught me in school, never use, never use a verse out of context as a proof text. Uh, so we can lift things up and create a whole doctrine out of a text. And, and Paul's sitting in heaven saying, that's not what I meant by that. <laughs> uh, and, and so much of that happens. So we want to try to understand things in context. Today, in that vein, we, we want to set the story up understand some level of who we're talking about and where all this stuff happened and what was going on at the time. So uh, I am going to assume nothing today. If you have been decades in the Bible or days in the Bible, I'm assuming we know nothing. So if you're like, oh, I've heard this a dozen times since I was 12. All right, put mark it as 13 because there's going to be some people that say, I did not know that. And so it's, it's those refreshers there. So let's understand. First of all, Timothy, 1 Timothy, is specifically what kind of writing? It's a letter. It's a, it's, and it's one of the pastoral epistles. Hang on to that for a second. I want to come back to that. It's a letter. So essentially, we're reading somebody else's mail. And so let's, let's understand. Let's take a step out here and look at the whole um, New Testament. And I have a peppermint for the first person that can tell me this. All right. What is the layout? If you've been in my class before, you know, you, you, you will remember this. Um, and I have a feeling I know who's going to get the peppermint. I know the anticipation is killing you. All right. What is the numerical layout of the New Testament. You remember the, so I'll give you the Old Testament. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. What's the New Testament? Who said that? Oh, Big Larry, the Big L, got the peppermint. All right. How many of you said, man, that was my answer? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 4 one, 21, one. All right, so let's do that together. Ready? One, two, three. 4 one, 21, one. All right, what does that mean? Four what? Gospels. Four Gospels. Now, yeah, there you go. Can I get a peppermint because we said Gospels? No, no peppermint for you. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the big L got it. Uh, 4 one. What's the one? It's Acts, and it's a historical book. Now, Pause for those of us who kind of get into the weeds of technicalities. Who wrote Acts? Luke. Who wrote Luke? Very good. So technically, they had this similar purpose. So you could say 3, 2, 21, 1. It just goes, you know, so let's just, you know, if you want the technicality of that, that'll work. But so volume 1 and 2, Luke and Acts. But we're going to go 4, 1, 21, 1 because it works really well. Uh, so 4, 1, 21 what? Letters. Personal letters or letters to churches that uh, were meant to inform, instruct, warn. Uh, and today we get a personal letter. And then one what? Revelation. Prophecy, revelation, and one apocryphal writing uh, that we dive into and wonder, what in the world is he talking about uh, oftentimes? But I tell you, one of the most rewarding experiences, and I've shared this with you before, uh, that you'll do, if you'll just take the time to do it, is go to your, a Bible app that will read to you, plug it in, and read the book of Revelation. Have the book of Revelation read to you as you follow along in one sitting. And you will be blown away. Because that was originally how it was written. To be, and you'll be blown away. I'm telling you, the first time I did it was just, wow. You just want to worship because that's exactly what they were doing. And then you do it again. It's just, it just gives me chills just thinking about it. It's a pretty, pretty cool experience, isn't it, Luann? It is. it is. So, I mean, you did it, what, two or three days in a row? Yeah. yeah. And so it is, so even if we're not even sure what all the ins and outs of that is going on, it's very encouraging just to listen and read it. Uh, I promise you'll get a lot out of it. So, our, most of the New Testament letters, the vast majority of them, have their origins in the book of Acts. 
All right, so you read uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Well, Paul came through the city in Macedonia in his second missionary journey called Thessalonica, and you can read about that. You, he came down into Corinth, and then later he wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. Same thing with Ephesus here in Ephesians in 1 and 2 Timothy. And so this particular study takes us into uh, 16, 18, 19, and 20 of, of all the people involved there. So that's why we're going to spend a little time there. Uh, as you had mentioned, uh, 1 Timothy is what's called part of what's called the pastoral epistles. Uh, first, 1 Timothy, then Titus was written, then 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was Paul's last letter. We'll get into that later, but into the fall. But they're written in a very personal way. Timothy was left in Ephesus. Titus was left uh, sent to Crete to do work in the church there. And so here is this apostle giving pastoral advice on how to be pastoral to a tough group of people. So there's a whole lot of, of, of good stuff that we, we glean uh, from this. Uh, again, personal writing, personal letter, but the intent was Timothy's reading it with the church in Ephesus reading over his shoulder. It was intended to be, okay, once you get this down and I want you to read this, from me to you. You need to read this to the rest of the church. So let's, uh, let's look at some things here. Uh, you know what? I forgot, to, I forgot to click. There you go. If you want a picture, uh, we'll put that up there. Uh, all right. There you go. If anybody wants these, these just let me know. You're, you're welcome to them. Uh, I'm going to go quick, so I don't want anybody perusing my work for misspelled errors, uh, spelling errors, as we did Brian Rucker, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> or I did, anyway. So Timothy, uh, let's, let's look here in chapter 16 of Acts. Let's, let's understand a little bit about Timothy here. Um, verse 16, or excuse me, chapter 16, verse 1. Um, now, before I get into this, the first part of the book of Acts is surrounded a lot in Jerusalem and in Samaria. Okay, if you can picture that in your mind. Actually, I think I have a, yeah, here we go. So, uh, working two screens here, I'll try to go back and forth. Uh, Jerusalem is right here, okay? Uh, you can see it down here at the very bottom. Does this work? Uh, yeah, but not on the screen. Jerusalem's right here. This is kind of where, so if you can just picture this, the first part of the book of Acts occurs in that city. You start moving, persecution starts happening, and it starts to spread out into the region. And then Saul is converted, becomes Paul. He goes on the first missionary. The rest of the book of Acts is about his missionary journeys. All right, so he's converted in Acts chapter 9. It spreads to Samaria. Then about 12 or so, uh, he starts going, he starts traveling around. So you see the little island off the coast there? Um, that's, uh, that's the first little missionary journey there. And then he goes on a second missionary journey. Uh, and this is the third missionary journey that you're looking at. I thought I had the second one up there. But I guess I don't. Um, I did it, but it must not have uploaded. Okay, no big deal. So he meets, so we don't have the second missionary journey there, but that's okay. But understand that that's the rest of the book of Acts is his journeys. And you're talking, even though it's just a few chapters, about a decade worth of, of history is happening here. I mean, it could be a few years between this verse and this verse uh, that's going on. So let's, let's look here. He came to Derba. Uh, chapter 16, verse 1. He came to Derba and then the Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Now, now, let's keep reading. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews living in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened and grew in faith and grew in numbers daily. Uh, 
So a few things here. His family situation, his mother, and we read also later that his grandmother were Jews. But the grandmother, uh, the mother married a Greek man who, uh, that, and that would, and I put the word mamzer up there, that would be, make him a mamzer. Okay, there's some derogatory terms that we would use as a, uh, of someone that would be a mamzer today, we won't say, but is basically a person that is the product of a unlawful union. And unlawful meaning it was not uh, lawful in the law of Moses for a Jewish person to marry someone who was not Jewish. And she did. And so here is Timothy, a person who is of Jewish and Greek heritage, and his father would not allow him to be circumcised. Now, circumcision um, was for various reasons a mark of the sign of the covenant with, uh, of being a Jew. Um, it was, I mean, we can go into all kinds of reasons as to why, but it was, it was a very serious thing in Judaism. Um, and for his father to refuse that, what, what kind of social implications would that be for Timothy? Yeah, he would be an outcast. He wouldn't have a place. He couldn't go into the synagogue. He couldn't do temple worship. He, he, could, he could be a great guy. In fact, it says he was a great guy, and everybody spoke uh, well of him in his community, but he didn't have a place. Um, so Paul recognized, and we find out later, too, in, in, in 1 Timothy, that he was rather timid, uh, prone to frequent illnesses uh, for whatever reason. Um, but Paul saw him and saw something in him. So here's a, here's a young man who had no, didn't have an acceptance in his mother's community, and his father was an unbeliever. In fact, it even says she was a Jew and a believer, uh, meaning she was a Jewish Christian. And, but where is my place in this? And Paul says, I've got a place for you on my mission team. But before we go, we got to talk about, you got you to convert to Judaism. And so here's a young man whose father, we're assuming, because he was Greek and obviously well-known in the area, refused to let him be circumcised when he was young. As a young man now, whatever age, Paul has got to perform the Jewish rite of circumcision uh, and so that he can be accepted as a convert to Judaism in the Jewish community. All right. What questions come to mind? Uh, well, ouch, yeah. Ouch, yeah. And that wasn't the question I was thinking, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Ouch. Um, okay, well, that wasn't coming to mind either, but obviously. <laughs> how did they know? How, did they, how would they know? Okay, so this is how they would know. Um, so uh, in our world, okay, this is, this is a good lesson on, on one. First of all, why circumcision? Uh, mark of the covenant. Um, and I've said this before. Um, I think, Damon, you had visitors here the last time we talked about this. There were visitors from Alabama, I think, and they were like, like, sorry, we get to talk about circumcision when you're first time to White Street Road. But it was it, the mark of the covenant. You know, of course, we know that from the Old Testament. If you're a Jew, you were circumcised. Though it was not necessarily strictly uh, Jews in the ancient world. There's, there, are, there were some that did uh, circumcise males on the, uh, but, but it was not super common practice. Every male in the Jewish nation on the eighth day was circumcised. And it was the sign of the covenant. There's a lot of reasons. One, uh, later on we find out that baptism is, is a type of circumcision that's cutting away of the, of, of the sin. Um, and, and we're baptized spiritually of uh, that cutting away. We see that in Colossians 2, which we'll get to that, uh, re refer to that in a minute, but Colossians in a minute. But, uh, but it was a reminder. Okay, one, it was a commitment. It was a commitment by the parents because the child had nothing to do with it. 
the parent said, we're committing this child and we're trusting God, we're trusting this person to do this very intricate thing and very personal thing, uh, and we're committing them to God. The other uh, aspect of this, and this is not necessarily, you find this, this is just kind of in tra Jewish lore and, uh, and tradition, is that it would be, uh, you're a part of the covenant and you are going to keep a covenant line going by making covenant children, okay? So that's that idea that that's why it was so important in, in, to have children. And that's why it was so awesome that Abraham, who couldn't have children, had children by a miracle of God and intervention from the Lord uh, who created the nation. So that, we can get into all of that, but that's, that's a, that's, it gets pretty, pretty deep in the weeds sometimes with that. The other is this. And this is the last time I said this, I embarrassed uh, Annette, sorry. The, uh, was several times a day, several times a day, a man will be reminded that he is part of the covenant. Okay? You just kind of let that one play out in your mind. All right? But that's just the fact of it. Uh, you go to the restroom, you take a bath. I mean, you're reminded you're part of the covenant. When you get married, your wife is going to know you're part of the covenant, okay? A little PG-13 today, but that's okay. <laughs> We're all adults. But that is the fact of the matter. So why? So you ask why? That's why. That's one of the, it's a, it's a complex reason why. and gives us some, maybe a, a picture of that. Okay, maybe it's not so bad. But the question I was wondering <laughs> is this. The decision that they were going to tell the churches and start new churches and tell synagogues was based in Acts chapter 15 that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised to, be, to become Jews in order to become Christians. So for the first number of years, if you're, a, if you're a Gentile and you want to become a Christian, you've got to go through the rites of becoming a Jew. And a lot of them did. So you talk about commitment. You know, I'm like, okay, you baptize me. Keep your hands to yourself there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, I don't know about the rest of it, but it's a, uh, but, and so there's this uh, thought, of course, whenever it happened in Acts chapter 10, without getting into all that, you come along, the, the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem said, you know what, we were, we were off on this thing. Jew, Gentiles can come to the Lord on their own. They don't have to kind of come through the through and, and become a Jew first. So they're like, let's go tell them. But here's this young Gentile Jewish anomaly here, and we're going into Jewish territory. And there's a whole thing with that too. Jewish territory. They go into synagogues first. Who can't go into a Jewish synagogue unless he's Jew? Timothy. So we're going to make you Jewish so that you can come with me and teach the people. That was, that was the whole reason of that. And you talk about a commitment. It was the commitment that Timothy made. And it was a trusting one uh, there as well. So you got this guy. Uh, now, does that make sense? That, I mean, that was a lot at one time. Does that, you follow that? Uh, does that kind of flow? Uh, there, kind of maybe answer questions that you've always said. I've always wondered that, but uh, yes, sir. I believe that. I, I think he probably, it would have looked like he converted to Judaism, um, but he practiced. Uh, uh, yeah, I think he became all things to all men, by, so that he may, I mean, all, all means save some. Um, and he, I think in that text, you know, to the rich, you know, to the poor, I became poor, to the, you know, all these different things that he says he became. But that was to, to so the, the message would not be hindered. Yeah. Do I think, I don't, I don't know if, think Timothy probably, or I don't think Paul put it upon Timothy uh, to practice all the festivals and the feasts and, and, and practice what Jews practice. But uh, it would look like um, he was a Jew. He would look Jewish <laughs> whether he practiced it or not. 
good, good point, good point. Um, and there are Jews, by the way, Messianic Jews, uh, that practice their Judaism in view of the gospel, in view of Jesus. My daughter had a roommate her fir- at Harding her first semester, uh, her first year at Harding. Uh, she was a Jewish person and um, from Maryland, and uh, pra- they, her, they practiced Judaism. And I asked her, do you practice the food laws? She said, they do. Her, her and her mother did, but her father didn't. So she came and stayed a week with us at Thanksgiving, and I bought lamb because, uh, you know, we're frying turkey and <laughs> cooking ham, you know, sorry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I bought lamb, which was very expensive, uh, by the way, out at, out at Sam's, and I tried to cook it. Never again. You know. <laughs> I was not good at cooking lamb. Give me a pulled pork, a pork butt on a smoker, we can do it. Lamb? No. The, uh, but she appreciated the effort. I asked her, I said, is it good? She's like, no. <laughs> You're an honest Jew. <laughs> Didn't hurt my feelings. But uh, So, uh, Paul and Timothy. Paul calls Timothy his true son in the faith. Uh, he was a, a, he took him under his wing. He gave him a place. He loved him unconditionally. Obviously, Timothy trusted him because he submitted to the circumcision and left his area and went wherever uh, and spent years working uh, with with Paul uh, on two different missionary journeys. And now he's flying solo in Ephesus uh, for the first time um, that we can see. Uh, Paul trusted Timothy to nurture and take care of people. He was, uh, and I, I guess he was that guy. He was, you, you know, you have those people uh, that, that if you want something done, uh, then you give it to this person and you know it's going to be done very, very well. Uh, they're going to have, they're going to, they're going to think about every aspect and they're make sure it's, everything's lined up as it should. Timothy, I, I get to be that person. Also very nurturing. They had uh, gone, and you can read this in the book of Acts, they had gone to this, uh, I forget the, which area it was, but Paul was, I think they were in Athens, um, and, uh, and they were so concerned about what was happening, maybe they were in Thessalonica, and so concerned, ah, no, 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 okay, I'm getting it mixed up now. They were down south, and they were so concerned about what was the, the brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, so he sent Timothy back up there uh, to check on them. And then they caught back up with him, and Paul wrote the letter. He's just now come to him, and he tells me how you're coming along in your faith. And we see, uh, here we'll see here in a minute, as he goes, as he's decided to leave Ephesus and go on over into Macedonia, uh, he says, look, y'all go ahead and get things set up. And he kind of sent people ahead of him there. So Timothy was that trusted guy to take care of things, to nurture people, to check on, on people. But, you know, always working behind the scenes, Kind of a Joshua to Moses and uh, Aaron, just making sure things were taken care of. And then all of a sudden, hey, I need you to stay in Ephesus and put things in order. What? Who, me? Um, So, what about this city? So, we can see, yeah, this is the missionary journeys. This is all the maps in the back of your Bible. How many of you looked at maps in the back of the Bible whenever the preacher was preaching you were little? Yeah. Yeah. It's something to look at because you didn't really understand what he was saying. At least that's my experience, um, but uh, growing up some. But this was, you can see where we are. Ephesus is way up here on this uh, top part. Uh, where are we at? I don't even see it. There it is right there. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also see Ephesus later in what book? Ephesians, okay. We also see it in it's one of the letters written in the, uh, to the seven churches in Asia Minor in the book of Revelation. So this whole little area right here is what we're talking about. Uh, being in Ephesus, um, uh, we'll get to Ephesus here. The, in fact, go ahead and flip over to chapter 19. Um, I'm going to spend a little time there. Um, what other, I, I have another peppermint. 
what other books or letters in the New Testament are related? Besides 2 Timothy and Ephesians, what other ones might be related to in and around the city of Ephesus? It's got, yeah, the, it's got the, the, the church in Asia Minor. We also have Colossians. Colossians. And uh, who said it? Oh, you need to learn to steal the answer, Ruthie. You could have you got a peppermint. There you go. Get your peppermint there. It's not because you got the right answer. It's because you needed one. The, uh, uh, yeah, the, Coloss the Colossian church in Colossae was started by the church in Ephesus. Uh, so also, what's, what's related to Colossae? The letter to of, of Philemon is, is related. So you have a lot of ins and outs in and around the city of Ephesus. Um, they worked in this city for two years. I had a picture. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to, to import. But the, uh, of, of the city, of, of a rendering of what the city of Ephesus looked like. It was one of the primary cities in the Roman Empire. You know, you think as a... Uh, let me put that up there. Uh, population of somewhere between two and three hundred thousand, and and for an ancient city, it was pretty good for a city. And I mean, <laughs> a, look, we got about one hundred and fifty thousand in Washtenaw Parish. And it's a little big for me. Um, uh, going in and out of Baton Rouge, where I've got three family, four family members living down there now. It's uh, how big is Baton Rouge? How big is y'all's area down there, Clay? Yeah, can you, I mean, that's just a lot to manage uh, with that. And in ancient times, 250,000 is a lot. Um, and so, big city, major city going on. Um, Artemis of the Ephesians is where her, she was a, a goddess. Uh, she's also called Diana. Uh, worshipped in and out the region, but it was the home, the, her temple was there. A lot of pilg was there in Ephesus. A lot of the pilgrimages would occur there. A uh, major part of the economy there. Uh, her temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. She was a mother goddess. Uh, a lot of a lot of ins and outs that came with the worship of her. Emperor worship was also prominent in Ephesus, and um, they, uh, of course, as it was throughout the whole the whole Roman Empire, they worshipped their emperors as gods. Uh, a hub of trade and routes coming through the coast. There was this, and, and, and you can look this up. Is it the, I think it's the Aegean Sea that, that comes in there. And there was this, this, this river, and they created this kind of like a harbor. It's like you would see something in the Mediterranean, and it, it was there. And uh, it was, it would, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then these palaces, the gymnasiums, the baths. Uh, and again, this is a, the Greek Roman influence, uh, the immorality that was there. Public baths, ooh, who does that? Very common. And, and they were all, you know, you just show up and, you know, just jump in and all just kind of, it's like swimming and, you know, bathing together, but they all did that without clothes on. And so... That's another reason you know you're Jew or not. So, uh, and the gymnasium that was there when they would compete in the games, the original uh, uh, Olympians, they competed naked. And so, you just the whole, it, so when you get to First Timothy, he talks about dressing modestly and how you should be. It's totally in this craziness of culture there. Donna, what'd you, you had your hand raised? Mm. So you think about the arch in St. Louis? Yeah, and that's that gateway to the west idea. This was it. Everything from the east would come through, uh, a lot would come through Ephesus to get to the, down the harbor, into the, down the, down the river, into the Aegean that would get you into Greece and into Italy. A lot happened through there. If you could just think about New Orleans, yeah. There are several New Orleans cities there uh, in, in the Greek Empire. 
So, Acts 19, let's spend a minute reading here. Uh, while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul took the road, uh, verse 1, through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples asking them uh, if they received the Holy Spirit. No, let me just kind of go through this one. They didn't, we didn't know about the Holy Spirit. We know about John's baptism. So he baptized them. They all spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 in all. Okay. You're like, okay, what just happened there? All right, original converts. Well, we'll get into that sometime. Because uh, I've, I've got my five-minute warning going on right now. <laughs> Spent too much time talking about wine circumcision. <laughs> But it was good. Uh, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively. If he's in a synagogue, who's he talking to? Jews. Persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Uh, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And you talk about, all right, you won't listen? We got people who will. So the, the, it is spreading. And what you see, if you, if you look at the map here, down where Jerusalem is, the hub of, of Christianity was Jerusalem. Very quickly, it moved up the coast there to a town called Antioch. And then it moved to Ephesus. And this, you, you start seeing these centers of Christianity and the gospel spreading throughout, uh, which was God's plan all along. And that's kind of a layout of the book of Acts. Well, look here in verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, uh, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. In other words, he was, uh, there was, you, you go down, if, if you've been to Disney World, yeah, it's, uh, or, or any amusement park like that, you know, you're, you're if Disney World, you're standing in line, and everything is just in your face, buy this, buy this, and while you're wa waiting, you go to the ride, you get off, you know where you end up when you walk out of? A store where you could buy overpriced stuff. That's what's happening here. You come for your pilgrimage to Ephesus to worship Artemis, guess what? We've got a shrine for you. You can take her home for $19.95. <laughs> Wait! In two minutes, you get two shrines. <laughs> Hurry while supplies last. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, so you got this little trade union going on. And so you have a, a uh, of, of everybody. I mean, you know, we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray a large number of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. Because what was happening? They stopped worshiping Artemis and started worshiping who? Jesus, uh, in the, the true living God. And that hit them in the pocketbook. They're not buying the shrines, any of the, the little idols anymore. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but here's the emotional tug, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis, who will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, oh. <laughs> It's about the money. Yeah. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and our, our, our yeah, that guy. Uh, Paul's traveling commandants uh, from Macedonia and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most didn't even know why they were even there. Man, yeah, there's a riot. Let's go. We'll get us a TV. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they shouted, All in unison for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her Im image which fell from heaven? 
Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. Not dealing with truth, but a rational guy. Uh, you have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Pro they can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, now he pulls the, 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 the rook card here. We are, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. You're going to get in trouble. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. So that's what's going on. This is where Paul left Timothy to set things in order. There's a lot in 1 Timothy. There's, we're calling this study uh, marching orders, a study of discipleship. He says, I'm leaving you here. This is what I want you to do. I want you to spend some time warning about false teachers. So we're going to spend some time understanding what false teachers are and what they aren't. It's not necessarily people that we disagree with, but people who actually are false teachers. We're going to spend some time about that. How to live holy and orderly lives as opposed to what you grew up with possibly in Ephesus. It's about godly leadership, how to treat people, how to take care of people. And just some practices about how to live holy in an extremely unholy, ungodly world. You know, most of this letter is easy to digest. As we said earlier, there are some difficulties. We'll hit those. Uh, chapter 2, a lot of people get caught in the end of chapter 2 about, you know, what it means with the different roles. And that's a big buzz thing in, in the in church world today. Uh, and then you got this strange verse that no one can really understand. It, it, no one can maybe understand, but they, they, they can't come to a consensus on about women will be saved through childbearing. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that. We're going to wrestle with that. Some of this we'll wrestle with. And some, though, it's going to be just like, oh, yeah, that goes down like ice cream. No problem. Uh, some goes down like a Brussels sprout. So I like it. Much like Timothy, understanding the people, Timothy and Paul, Paul, pulling things out of him he never saw himself. Uh, I would imagine there's some Timothys in this room, there's Timothys watching online, that never saw yourself doing something, but now you're doing it. Um, and because someone spoke into you, uh, I never saw myself standing in front of a group of people, ever, teaching. Never wanted to. I was always scared to. Uh, I stuttered. Went through three years of speech therapy, stuttering. Never stuttered with my speech therapist, but, you know, I stuttered everywhere else. And I, uh, you know, it was, uh, I never saw myself as smart enough to be able to teach or in, uh, never intelligent. Barely got by uh, with school. But, you know, somebody spoke something into me one time and said, I want you to do this. I don't know about that now. Um, but you know what? It changed the direction and the trajectory of my life. There was at one point in my life when I taught at OCS, when I taught Bible, and I was youth minister here, six days a week, Sunday to Friday, I stood in front of people talking and teaching. That is not me. That's all God. That's exactly what Paul did with Timothy and said, I want you to go set things in order. You. And he did. I wonder where our Timothy is in this class. When someone shoulder taps you and says, I want you to do this. You're like, no, you're nervous. I'm not coming back to class. Somebody may ask me something. So remember, we are secondary recipients uh, of this letter from a secondary author. God is the primary. And the original recipient was Timothy. But we will dive in, we'll study, we'll wrestle, we'll glean some truths. Um, and I want to encourage you, as you study, as we do this, spend some time reading 1 Timothy a couple of times a week. Okay, Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, just the ability to easily open it up and the accessibility that it is to us. And I pray, Father, that... 
that we will do, be good stewards of your word as we study. Bless our day. Uh, be with Alan as he preaches this morning. Through Jesus.